Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name's Cameron. I'm a product manager at Uber. I've been there for about seven years, as was already said. Uh, when I started at Uber, I was uh, actually driving around the country with a box full of iPhones, setting up shop inside of Panera's and onboarding drivers. Now, the company and the industry has grown a lot in that time, and I've been fortunate enough to grow along with it. Um, and Mobile Link has been, or sorry, Uber has been responsible for a lot of groundbreaking tech. Movable Inc. has been responsible for groundbreaking tech as well. Uh, but I'm excited to share a little bit about what we're doing at Uber today in terms of powering personalization. So just like the real world, uh, everyone on the Uber platform is not animating, uh, chasing a dream or funding a passion. They are. Uh, chasing their goals, and these are relative to an individual. Um, as they're making these decisions, these are all relative to their own intentions, their own goals. And as marketers, it is not enough for us to just acknowledge this, but we actually, it's our responsibility to optimize for it and embrace it. So as a uh, product manager, my product is essentially data. And the, the intention is to make this data available to our marketing teams in ways that they can capitalize on. Uh, to get everybody on the same page, I'm actually going to use the gaming industry as a metaphor. Uh, and this is, we're going to talk about three uh, varieties of narrative design in the gaming industry. So first, uh, we have the linear progression. Quick demo check. Who played Sonic growing up? We're in the right place. OK. So the, the player progresses through an authored sequence. Uh, they start the game going left to right. And no matter how many times you play the game, the story points still hit at the same spot. Doesn't matter how many coins you collect. And there's no real decision making happening as you progress through this game. The second variety is branch and bottleneck. Let's do another demo check. Mario 64. Great. So in this scenario, the player has an option. Uh, there's actually more objectives available than are required to continue the story. So uh, in Mario 64, you only need 70 stars to get to the end of the story, uh, but there are 120 available. So this introduces some decision-making capability, some agency on the player uh, to determine you know, what, what they choose to get through, but it doesn't alter the story points as you progress. Now, this can be a more unique playthrough style, but uh, at the end of the day, the story is still happening in the same sequence. The, uh, the most recent variety of narrative in video game design is that of an open world. So this is where the player can approach objectives very freely. When you start the game, you could go to the final boss and try to fight it. Now, whether you win or not is a different story, uh, but the narrative in these video games is, is constructed through encounters with other characters. So as an example, um, let's say you start this game, and you go down the preferred path. This is where you meet your counterpart. And this is uh, a character that's going to be with you for a couple of levels. Uh, when you approach your counterpart, they say, who are you? Now, if we start this game again, and instead of going the preferred path, we go the open world route, and we uh, choose to enter a level where we save someone from being kidnapped. Um, and then you go back and you meet your counterpart. Uh, instead of saying, who are you, they say, oh, I heard you saved so-and-so from being kidnapped. You're a legend. Nice to meet you. Now, the dialogue has changed. It's aware of the actions that the user has taken. And this is only possible because of what is being logged. So the game is aware of a number of things. Uh, firstly, the user state and the user attributes. So this is like, what's the user's health? What do they have in their inventory? What's in their bag? Uh, the world state as well. So where have they been on the map? What have they already seen? How many times have they seen it? And also the game state, uh, the, larger, the larger world, I suppose. But it's like, what is available? What is left to do? What is like, if you were to start this game and you were to run into a building and there was a level inside of that building, well, the game state needs to be aware that that level is no longer accessible. So if we're talking about narrative, 
we have to have a story. And this is actually going to compound the amount of writing that's required. Um, we, we also have to make some concessions about how we're telling this story. Because we don't always know where the user has been, where they're coming from. Copywriters may not appreciate that. But it multiplies the immersion of this game. No two players have to play the same ex or have to have the same experience as they play through this. And even one player can play through this game multiple times and have different unique experiences. Some of these charts that I was showing may look familiar. Uh, many of our like marketing automation software, our ESPs, allow you to drag nodes onto a canvas and connect these uh, communications in a specific way. Um, but we can think of these as some of the campaign types. So a linear progression is like a time series drip. Again, left to right, you enter in at a certain point. After a certain amount of time, you get the next message, the next message, until you, until you exit. For, I think, modern automations, which is very likely what many people in here are actually doing now, sure, you may have some dynamic content. You may have some uh, path switching, depending on the actions that the user takes. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do today is help everyone understand the infrastructure that's required to level up to contemporary personalization. Getting started uh, is, is difficult because data, you don't know where to start. Uh, data is really scattered. Uh, we don't know how this information needs to be organized, uh, what needs to be connected, uh, what are the dimensions that should be considered, or are we actually incorporating all of the appropriate perspectives on the data in order to act on it. There are three pillars of work that are required to enable this for your company. Firstly, I'll talk about drawing the map, then what we need to keep track of, and lastly, how to introduce wayfinding creative into your campaigns. So drawing the map is a very classic business practice. Uh, you've got your product features and the surfaces that you're going to communicate on. Uh, these are basically the story points, and you're going to identify how you want people to engage with these. Now, then it's marketing's responsibility to essentially predict what kind of information needs to be presented to the user before they arrive at any of those points. And if you complete this, you've essentially just done the customer journey, uh, customer journey map. Now, traditionally, these are done in maybe Excel sheets, top to bottom, uh, or Lucidchart or other similar charting software, left to right. Uh, but what's really important is that this actually becomes a network. And so your map is critical. Uh, the reason this is is because you will be able to identify your blind spots where we didn't know that a user could arrive at this point from that point. And if it's linear, those are much harder to find. So draw the map. It should be a network. What are we keeping track of? User attributes. We assume everybody here has a table or a database of the you know, sales for a particular user, maybe some of their preferences, or uh, how they've engaged, with this, what's their click-through rate. Um, but knowing what a user has done recently is actually not enough. Uh, we also need to know the, uh, like what they have seen, how often they have seen it. Now, these next areas are a little bit hard to justify from a funding perspective for marketing, but they're equally as important in powering these permutations. The product state is critical. There has to be log of what, what the version of the product is, what features are available for that user. And, so, and lastly, the world state is especially important for Uber as a global company, uh, where we have a variety of features and products that may or may not be available based on where you are. But we're also impacted by global events, like many of us understand with COVID. Uh, but even things like connectivity in a certain country, whether or not a specific feature or product is available, um, all of these things are relevant pieces of data to connect to your user attributes when we're considering how to personalize. Third area is wayfinding creative. So I think everybody does. Everybody does something similar to this, and we're, of course, doing it as well. Uh, a user qualifies for an objective. Now, this is a little bit of gaming terminology, but think of this as a product announcement or a flash sale, something similar to that. We've developed our creative. We've got our audience. We're going to batch and blast. We're going to produce this thing and let everybody know. Um, the second one is the first time that they actually encounter a feature. Uh, so this just became available 
uh, to the user. Maybe they like finally arrived at a particular landing page, and so we want to send some additional communications. This is a great opportunity to do uh, testimonials or you know, value props across the communications you're sending. Uh, the, my favorite one is actually the contextual variance. So this is where you have to stop and consider your map. This is understanding where are all of the places that this user could have come from to arrive at this point now. Now, instead of continuing to create new campaigns, what you start doing is you can look backwards, and I'll touch on that in a second. So these are always on. This is critical. Again, we're not saying batch and blast, point in time, ad hoc send. We're saying there are triggers. And as people progress through our product, these triggers fire and these announcements go out. Users are always traversing your product at different speeds and from different points in time. They also have different goals. And so it's really, it's important to consider that if we're sending out a large product announcement, hey, this new feature is available, well, many of our future users aren't users right now. How can we incorporate that announcement into a life cycle journey? Again, that's always on, so they become aware of the feature product uh, that you're trying to send. So on the contextual variance, again, this is where we can get really deep. Again, instead of having a net new campaign or a net new life cycle every time, instead we start looking backwards. We say, here's the goal for our user or our campaign. What are the paths, what are the common paths that people have taken to arrive at the point where they've converted? Then we can look at if our data is set up correctly. We can look at what are all of the possible paths that people should have been able to come through. And we can figure out what the pattern is between should have gotten here and did get here and create campaigns to address those. Stepping back, uh, there was a lot of hard learned lessons in coming to this stage. Um, and so if you are interested in taking a photo, I would suggest this is the one I would take a photo of. Um, so I'm not going to touch on all of these, but a couple of, a couple of key points. This is great. I'll give everybody a second. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So firstly, there are many technical marketers in this audience that could set up the infrastructure that's required, or some of what is required uh, to make all of this work. But I need to emphasize, the systems that we're talking about, this is engineering work. It's critical to get both data science, if available, and engineers involved as early as possible. The next piece in the center is actually the asset repository and metadata structure. Um, if we're talking about like logging how many times a user has seen something, well, if we have version A of the creative and version B of the creative, we need to know that that's actually towards the same goal. And so establishing a metadata repository for your assets is also critical. Building with infinite permutations in mind is this mental shift that I think we all have to come to, um, copywriters and creative especially, where just because uh, we're used to telling a story linearly, it, it doesn't really lend itself to the type of personalization we're talking about. On that note, you will actually find the breaking point of your brand guidelines. Uh, so it's important to involve creative and copywriting regularly and often so that they're a part of the process. Um, but they'll either become your worst enemies or your best friends, and I hope they become your best friends. The last one to touch on is Instrumentation. If we're talking about measuring how many times something has been seen, understanding where they've been, where they're going, where they haven't been, where we want them to go. If you can't measure it, you cannot make it better. So like I said, as a product manager, my product is data, making it accessible. Um, but once we've actually accumulated all of this infrastructure and these resources, what happens? So this is our recommendations digest for Uber Eats, the line of business. Now, understanding things like cuisine preferences or where a user's last delivery location is are, of course, important for determining the actual recommendations that we provide. But we also wanted to optimize just the header here. And so some of the data points that we were considering are propensity for color engagement. What is the likelihood that someone clicks on something when it's blue versus tan? Um, 
estimated preference for illustrations versus photos is another piece. And also, the likelihood that a user will actually engage with something if the sentence is posed as a statement or a question. Again, these are user attributes. And each time we get an engagement metric, or each time someone engages with our content, that metric mod is modified. Now, the only way that we're able to personalize this, again, infinite permutations, is through Move Link. So this is their bread and butter image customization, and we love it. Through just customizing this header with some of the data that we've been describing, uh, we've seen a 25% increase in our click-through rate. And through this one campaign, uh, we've got an additional $10 million of attributable incremental gross bookings per month. And it's been a huge success for us. I hope that uh, understanding, well, while there is a, a lot of overhead in getting something like this started, uh, I hope you can see some of the benefits of evolving these communications and these campaigns from our time series drip or our linear progression into what I genuinely believe is the future of marketing, and that is contemporary personalization. Thank you so much. <laughs>